Hallo Freunde, willkommen in uh, API Review. Uh, es ist meine letzte API Review für zwei Wochen. Um, wir haben uh, zwei Rot Issuen. Um, auf geht's! Alright, that was my bad attempt at German. Uh, Are you going to hold up scorecards, you know? Rate, rate, his, uh, rate his attempt. I understood what he said. I'm not sure about you guys, but... I think I, we got the context. I'm sure I ruined most of my prepositions, because German prepositions don't map one-to-one -to, -one to English, but... Um, right, so, uh, we have some red issues for things people are hoping to get into today, I think, uh, in the next two hours. And... Uh, yeah, this will be my last review for two weeks, because I'm actually going to take a vacation. And actually, actually go somewhere on a vacation. So, uh, yeah, that'll be fun. Which is why I keep practicing my German. Uh, other order. And we had an urgent request for a very short thing. So, pass all interpolated string handlers by ref five seven five three eight. You want to talk, Steve, or should we just give it a thumbs up? Uh, we can do both. Um, uh, this should be knock on wood. Very fast. Um, so we've got a bunch of handlers that we previously approved, um, and you know they they're all there are methods that accept those handlers as arguments. For all of them except for the ones on debug, we pass them by ref. And for some reason, when I submitted the issue for debug, I didn't pass them by ref. Um, but I think we should basically have our handlers always be passed by ref because it gives us, well, the variety of reasons. Uh, one, and this might be a little counterintuitive, I think it makes it a little bit harder to accidentally use directly. We really want people calling these methods with interpolated strings and having them be ref makes it even more of a, like, what is this thing if you are calling it directly? Um, but the more important reason is, um, well, two important reasons. One, in general, these things end up being larger structs. It's better for perf to pass them by ref rather than by value. And the reason I actually care about it is um, if we want to do any kind of cleanup inside the handler as part of whatever the operation the method performs is, ideally it's done on the copy that was in the calling frame as well. And so passing it by ref allows us to clean clean up the one thing. Um, so uh, I would like to just change the methods on debug to pass them by ref. This is a breaking change from these APIs that we shipped in for the first time in preview seven. So it's a preview seven to RC one change. Yeah, that seems fine. I mean, presumably the compiler will still call it right with this, with the syntax. It, there no difference. If you're using interpolated strings, there's zero impact on the, on the syntax you write. I would only right. like, I had to change our tests because our tests call the methods directly. So I had to add ref in front of the things, but right. uh, for, you know, we don't expect anyone ever to call these methods with with the handler directly makes sense so it's basically the binaries won't work but the source code will recompile just cleanly yeah yeah, yeah that makes sense i mean i and, and i think steve you actually found an opportunity to do some cleanup in this code after you started taking it by ref right wasn't that the uh, string builder change you made yeah the string builder so change? on, on debug.write if we we're just always out so debug assert like the handler's only ever used if the assert is about to fail. Um, and so, like, we don't care about cost when it's about to fail because we're about to crash anyway. Um, someone raised the issue in an issue that, well, what about debug right if, like, you know, that maybe you're you're using that in case where you do care about cost. And so it's a, a one or two line change to change it to use string builder cache instead of creating a new string builder each time. But then we need to return it to the cache and to return to the cache, you really want to like, you know, return it and then zero out the state in the handler, which makes passing it by ref much more um, desirable. Yeah, I mean, basically we're wanting class semantics, but without waking up the GC. Exactly. All right. Um, the, the only downside, and I'll mention it just for completeness, and, it's the, and the same downside exists other places as well, so this is just being consistent with those other places is, you know, if you have an overload, that would also be, if someone were calling this directly with the type, um, there is another overload on debug.writeif that accepts object state 
And so if you don't say ref before the argument, it'll bind to the one that takes the object state uh, rather than the one that takes the ref handler. Um, you'll immediately find out because you'll get output that makes no sense. You'll basically get the type name output as your string. Um, uh, and we don't expect anyone to be using these things directly anyway. But that's the, right. the only downside I can think of for this. That seems fine. I agree. I mean, the four, the six people that will call the API by hand, as you said, they will find out very quickly. Yeah, as I did when I forgot to change one line of our tests. <laughs> <laughs> and probably at least four of those six people uh, haven't done it yet against Preview Seven. So. Okay. Right. So. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for noticing it um, now. As opposed to after shipping? The later it gets, the harder it is to fix, yeah. After shipping, it's nigh impossible to fix. All right, Go back to streaming zoom. All right. Add binder options, bind single element to array flag 57325. All right, Salty. so for this one, uh, what we have is we wanted to basically add a API to the binder option, a, a, add, a, add a flag to the binder options. And the reason being is that if you compare the two samples there, one that, that is a JSON uh, sample and then another one in the middle, which is a XML sample, if we wanted to bind, let's say the JSON one, there is a way that we can say that the metadata can be an array, but for the XML, we can't. And um, we have a partner request for having this API ship be added for Stixo, and then they're also in the meeting today as well. And so what we're gonna do for this is if you scroll a little bit further down, you'll see we have, we're gonna add, um, bind single elements to array, which when it's true, it will treat the metadata as an array. So then, why would we not just make this work? I mean, it's not a breaking change in the sense that we would bind to something that, and because we would basically bind something that it wouldn't have bound before, right? So we would make an error case work. So you asked why wouldn't we do make it a, a breaking change? No, I mean, I'm saying like in the XML case, right, you, as you said, like there's no way syntactically, you know, sanely, I would say, to dis to differentiate between one or multiple. But we know when we are binding that we are binding to something that is typed an array, right? So why couldn't we just make this work? Mm, let me think. Um... Because normally, like our bar for breaking changes is when we make something work that didn't used to work, we don't think of this as a breaking change. Okay. Uh, the reason this is a breaking change is uh, this is not a breaking change for XML, uh, as you might think, but it is a breaking change for JSON, where uh, objects that were not bound before will be able to start binding from now. So uh, uh, think of this, right? Uh, we have multiple. Uh, the idea is that a single element can bound to multi uh, an array. Uh, originally in JSON, you can actually express our errors, but with this change, even when in a, if it can if a JSON contains an object itself, now that will also be bound to be errors. It is a uh, change in behavior in that sense. Could we Did change it to the fail? XML provider? Oh. Sorry, come again. Uh, go, go, student. I, 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 you should ask your question first. I, I, I was I was asking, did the scenario are we taking a scenario that used to fail and make it work, or are we taking a scenario that used to return A and we're now making it return B? Uh, okay, uh, this originally used to return null most of the time, uh, so it, it fails to bind most of the okay. time, uh, and we are now enabling it to actually start returning actual values. Okay. Uh, also, yeah, uh, it is uh, somewhat breaking in the sense that uh, there are options where you actually can throw exceptions. Now, that would be a conflicting behavior. Like, uh, do you want to throw an exception when it is an array or not array, right? You have to yeah, choose. Because, yeah, because no, normally the, the bar that historically has been used for breaking changes is if a scenario used to flat out fail, like throw an exception, and we're now making it work, normally that would not be considered breaking and would not normally 
it would not require any new API for configuration. But it sounds like you're saying um, people may have taken a dependency on the behavior that it returned null, which is not a failure. It's an actual return value. That is correct. Okay. Okay, yeah, I guess it all depends on your definition of fail, right? Basically, you're saying in the in the past we would bind it as null, even though there were elements, and now we would bind it to whatever the list is, right? Yeah, I would uh, be really interested to see someone trying to rely on that. Um, but a question is, since there is an explicit syntax for arrays with JSON and not for XML, like, could we change just the XML provider to have this new behavior by default? Uh, uh, Unfortunately not, uh, because at XML provider level, right, you do not know what the target type is. Like, you don't know if you're trying to bind to an array or an object in the XML provider itself. It only comes when you're trying to bind. Yeah, that's a good point. So until you start doing reflection on the binder, uh, we don't know that data. So it has to be in the binder. So uh, the binder is basically invariant to the syntax. Is that, is that what you're saying? So the, the, there's an interaction between the representation and the XML and the actual binder. Yes. So the binder uh, no so longer knows whether it comes from XML or JSON. Yes. Binder so doesn't. So binder works on a dictionary, pretty much. Oh, I see. Right. So the provider just gives you the dictionary. So what this means yes. is that if you set this option, that if you do supply an array. Um, that, or sorry, if you do expect a single value instead of an array, well, that will just stop binding. Uh, it will, st okay, uh, so if the flag is set to true and you provide a single uh, element in place where you need an array, it will work. Uh, that's the uh, that's the addition of the binding we are doing. So we'll convert sing any single element into arrays. My question is if TV show instead of being an array of metadata was a single mm -hmm. metadata. Oh uh, yeah, it won't bind. It it won't bind anymore, yes. even if it's a single metadata, like in the JSON, even if there's no array in the JSON, even if oh, it like it will, matches like, up so nicely. If, yeah, if it matches directly, it will bind. So if there is one TV show uh, as a single object and you provide it uh, a single object in JSON, it should bind, right? That's what the question. That? So, so the provider will provide a single element array, right? And then when binding to the type, Will it then remap that single element array to the single value? So uh, what I'm saying, so basically in this API, you set bind single elements to array to true, but in TV show, you have a non-array metadata. Is there any way to bind to the non-array metadata? Oh uh, yes, you can just have a metadata which is not an array, right? You can just have the standard metadata object. Which is not an array. Uh, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, can can we scroll up a little bit to the message to the in the descript in the description of the message? So in the metadata over there, uh, are you asking if like when we set the flag to true, is it going to make sure like that metadata is an array but not TV show? Is, you mean the differentiation between metadata and TV show, or and that's not the question? Because my understanding is that it, when it, when the flag is true, and correct me if I'm wrong, when the flag is true, any any uh, item in the XML if that has a name attribute will end up becoming an array. Is that true? Uh, no, the name attribute behavior has been changed uh, as far as I remember. So yeah. uh, it will. the idea is that everything, okay, uh, after this change, if we set it to true, the idea is everything, every element can be considered an array. That's the behavioral change we are making. Uh, but by default, it will try to uh, match everything to the strong object as is. If it fails to bind an array directly, or sorry, uh, as a direct object, it will then check if it is an array and try to bind to an array. So. In this example, if you see the TV show metadata array, right? Uh, today, if there is no metadata array and if there is just only a metadata, so public metadata, metadata, uh, the below example we should just work because it's one TV show and it contains one metadata. Uh, but if you put that metadata array, as you see in this picture, the example below will fail because uh, it is uh, deserialized today into a single object uh, under TV show, saying like it is just a metadata object. And the binder will try to bind to an array which uh, okay. doesn't work. Okay. Thanks, that cleared up my question. I mean, 
I'm not. I mean, the scenario makes sense to me. The only thing I don't like is this flag, and the reason I don't like the flag is that it basically, over time, it means that the complexity of these things grows and grows and grows, and I have a hard time constructing an example where somebody would actually be broken by this. I mean, yes, you can imagine that people are broken by this, but it seems also reasonable to say, you know, we invert the behavior of the flag, right? We basically say, by default, it's on, and then only if you're broken, you have to turn it off, right? Like, I mean, it seems generally desirable to have that just work, right? Uh, that is correct. Um, uh, so if you see at the bottom of the proposal, the default proposed is to be true. We are enabling this behavior by default. Uh, there might be cases uh, where, as we said, like people are actually expecting it to fail. So they right. can still opt out, but by default, we will enable this behavior. At least uh, that is the proposal we have. I see. So the API usage would basically be you wouldn't have to do that as the particular assignment. Yes. The default will be set to true. It can bind uh, objects to address by default. If people see that it's breaking them, they can always change it to false. That makes sense. I think I could live with that. I don't know. What, what, what do other thing? Yeah, I mean, the only scenario that I can think of that someone would be uh, broken broken would be they're loading or they're, they're already reading a config file that has an, a value that the setter was going to throw on that currently wasn't binding. And so that now it ends up manifesting and now they hit their throw when loading the config when they previously were, uh, it was getting skipped. So yeah, to me it feels like maybe just change the behavior, but an opt out is, I guess, okay. I mean, you could imagine that somebody happens to depend on the property being null, right? Or being basically not initialized, right? It doesn't even have to throw it, would just be you make a decision based on this being null and no longer, it's no longer null, now it's set to whatever the singleton ends up being in the configuration file, right? And it, yeah, if you'd never tested with that configuration, I can see how things yeah. might go south, but that seems, it, it I mean, seems again, very, like, very marginal. To me, yeah, to me, it's, this would not be in place update safe, right? We wouldn't do this on .NET Framework, right? But in, in core, it seems, well, you pull the new version of the package or you upgraded the, you know, your TFM, and then, yeah, that's the kind of changes that I think we would be okay with saying you have to absorb that because it seems 99% of people wouldn't be, you know, negatively impacted by that. At least that's what it feels like. There's a question from chat that asks, uh, basically, why don't we change the XML schema to have the metadata say yeah. metadata is array equal true. Because it's ugly uh, as heck. Yes. <laughs> it is not clear in that sense, right? It's very ugly. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I, I think I agree with Emo's uh, having the option to turn it off seems reasonable, um, but it should be on by default just because it, it feels like it's the natural flow. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit unfortunate that we can't isolate it to the provider because I would say in JSON, I would be okay with saying, well, you have to put the brackets if you really wanted an array. But in, in XML, it just seems you would have to have some container element around it. It, it just becomes really ugly. And and so, like, I think ideally we would just only do it for XML and then say for JSON, well, sorry, you have to put the brackets. That seems a bit more desirable, but like, I understand if we can't do that because there's like a, a layer of interaction in between, then so be it. Yep, unless the layer of indirection allowed the different file formats to return a, I found a single object, do with that what you will, in which case then it could only map differently from the yeah. XML, but, but yeah. Um, so I do, I, I guess I will question whether this needs to be API or if the risk of breaking someone is small enough that it should be app context. Oh, that's, I guess, fair. Um, yeah. I mean, my only concern is that it's very late. So we don't really know how impactful that is. So if, if what I said earlier is true, it basically pretty much impacts nobody, then an app context switch is probably okay. The problem with an app context switch though is how does how does the NuGet package read that if I'm running on you know .NET Core 5.0 with the new version of the package? 
Um, my understanding is in core the only way that you can get an app context switch is if you directly call app context dot set switch in main. So, but it's just a key value pair, right? So the library can read it no matter which which framework version you're running on, right? So we could yeah. use the same thing when you're running on .NET five with the newer version of the package, right? Yep. Also, yeah. uh, one one point which I want to raise there, right? If we want to put this in app context, uh, how like because this NuGet packages are targeting .NET standard too, so pretty much people who are using .NET framework can also use them. Uh, yeah. Will that still work on .NET framework? All the app context features. I mean, app context is just a special dictionary of string to boolean. Um, okay. On .NET Framework, it has support from reading values out of the registry or out of app or the exe config uh, on .NET, as well as somebody directly calling app context dot set switch on .NET Core. You can only use the API method of control. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, but app context is itself .NET standard too, so it's I think in .NET Framework inbox since four six if I, if my data is correct here, so it's. Yeah. One thing I don't know is that with, with other flags with binder options, like there's precedence of having like other flags and binder options to kind of change the defaults, but then for this one to kind of suddenly use app context switch. Well, the, yeah, this is this is the thing, right? It's it's kind of like a a tasting more than anything, right? If if we believe there is legitimate cases where you want to have it on and off, then I think it belongs uh, onto this API, right? But if we believe that it's literally just, a, you know, a way to opt out of behavior for some weird corner case, then it doesn't seem it's a desirable thing to carry around, right? So it's kind of more like the, do you think of this as a compact quirk or do you think of this as, oh, some people want behavior X, some people want behavior Y. And the way you describe it to me sounds more like it's a compact quirk where if you would have shipped this behavior, you know, from you know v1 we would have just had only that behavior and nothing else if that makes sense right and and i mean you're right the bind on public properties that one i would say is more like you know in the eye of the beholder whether you want that or not everyone unknown configuration i guess is similar so i can see the argument being made for those two at least to be options mm -hmm. But this one seems more like, well, we really want this to be the default for everybody, except when it really doesn't work for you. <laughs> yeah, the, the test for me is, assume we put this as true by default. Um, would you be surprised if you ever saw someone set it to false? If yes, then make it an app context switch. I mean, the only other argument in favor of having an API is you can't scope it, right? Per instantiation of the of the bind, whether right? so if you make it an app context, which it's for the app all on or all off, right? Which might be a bit too big of a hammer, maybe. Maybe, I don't know how many configs get loaded in a universe. I guess that's fair for the for most apps. It's just you know you you do the one pass of ASP.NET and the and the startup and then call it good. Also, uh, again, I want to raise a maybe a weird corner case. I want to see what you guys think about it, right? Let's say uh, some app uses both JSON and XML, uh, but uh, only their XML is affected, and the JSON they still depend on this null behavior. Uh, so this type of thing, it is very straightforward, solvable by the API. But I don't think you can actually solve this type of scenario using a app context switch, right? They can use bind two different binders for both of these two cases, but uh, if it's in the same app, but if both of them are in the same app, it can't be using app context switches. Right. So that that comes back to the when does like are people regularly calling bind more than once? If bind is ninety nine percent of the time called at most once in a process, then app context is totally fine. If the average process does like 38 of them, then then maybe you need it on a per bind call. Well, I think the the, the the problem that he was pointing out was less about the number of calls because you can have still one bind, uh, but like you have, you know, multiple providers, right? One of an XML file, one a JSON file and whatever, right? And so they're, they're, they're all part of the same configuration system now. And so they're like logically a single bind but then you want the behavior for half the providers, right? And you know neither the API nor the app context switch will solve that. And my answer to that would be, well, 
you know, you you are in the code. At that point, you have to change your code. Like yeah. you need to change your your configuration system such that you don't depend on the XML behavior. Right, because like you can't have half of the behavior and not the other half. There's a level here of, you know, you've you've had this bad value written in your config for a long time, and you basically never tested changing it, and now it's being read. And yeah, right. don't don't write things you don't actually test. Like, I guess that's true. I think the easiest fix would be you just change your configuration to actually. Be right. now. <laughs> that yeah, would be the, the way to fix it. I was just uh, trying to see what scenarios might fail in this, but yeah. Yeah, the way I mean, the way we generally think about breaking changes for core is we basically said like, okay, we we are okay with breaking changes if it's for the greater good, and the greater good is usually defined as, you know, less complexity moving forward and more more intuitive behavior by default, right? Then the question is, okay, if somebody is impacted by that change, like how would that manifest itself? Like, is 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 it easy to diagnose? If it is easy to diagnose, okay, how much how much churn does it impact me? Is it a one line change, or do I have to rewrite my app, right? So like it's all these degrees, and I think in this case it would be it's easy to diagnose, it's relatively straightforward to fix, and uh, so that seems making the bar, right? Versus the problem with .NET Framework is you 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 test your app, you deploy your app, then somebody upgrades the framework, and suddenly your app stops working, but you're no longer you know you're no longer on the machine, right? So that's the kind of thing why. On .NET Framework, that wouldn't be acceptable versus in core, the scenario is, well, you upgraded your package or you upgraded to TFM, but in either case, you're literally editing your application right now. So if stuff doesn't work right now, that's fine because you're clearly in the, you clearly have the ability to fix it, right? And, and that's kind of why those changes are okay on .NET Framework. We still don't want to make changes where, oh, you know, we renamed the namespace and now like nothing works anymore and it takes you like three days to get to a compiled state again. You know, yes, even though that's a breaking change, it would be too impactful for us to do, right? So that's why it kind of depends on how how it manifests itself. The other thing is just behavior, right? Like if the behavior is super hard to diagnose because it's some threading API, but we change some subtle behavior and suddenly you add dead logs, yeah, that's also not great because, yeah, it's a breaking change, but it's very hard to test. It's very hard to diagnose when you get hit by that. And so we try to avoid that too, right? Makes sense. All right, so then uh, seems like we're pretty much okay with even the API, I guess. I mean, I don't have strong opinions. I can live with the app context switch. I can also live with the property, given that it allows for more scoping for some people. Um, I would just make sure the default is true. Yes. Yeah, if we think we need the option to be public API, then as long as the default's true, I'm in agreement. Uh, my personal preference is no API here and just do it as app context. And then delete it in the next version because app context switches shouldn't exist for more than one version. That's basically what it means when you decide you want an app context switch is this is you get compat, thing, yeah. we're fixing it, we're moving on. Yeah, the problem, I think this is why I think app context switches work better for the stack. They work less for libraries because it's like, well, for .NET, Platform versions, you can you I guess can say the next version for a package is a bit hard. Like, what's the next version of the thing? That's true. The 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 the, the oobs may uh, may be different. So maybe it's just easier. I mean, the other problem with app context switches they're not really discoverable, right? The only way you discover them is by reading the release notes of the stack. Which again, if you're using an Ubum .NET framework, you're not reading the .NET seven release notes, right? Like that's no. But if we to make the behavior true by default, you're also not going to go look for, look at it. Right, but then again, if at least stuff stops working, I mean, you kind of assume, well, I maybe I have to call a different API or something, right? Right, I'm saying they're both the same. Something went wrong, now you're looking for a solution, and one solution tells you, go edit your call to bind to pass in bind single element to array equal false, and another one tells you, go call app context dot set switch. I guess that's true. Like, once you're in the, I have to discover it. It's, the it's entirely reactive, it. so. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm fine either way. So I, I kind of leave it to the rest of the room to make a to make up your mind. <laughs> in theory, one one more question: if if we use the app context switch and then uh, folks were uh, like there was feedback about keeping this, then on our next release we could theoretically just add the uh, add the this API and then not use the app context switch. That's also possible. Just yeah, curious. You can also um, leave it. For longer than one version, because oobs are, yeah, complicated. Yeah, I mean, 
normally I would say if this would be early in six, I would probably start with an app competitive switch and then see how many people actually complain. And if it's, if it's enough, maybe it warrants an API. Um, but it's a bit late for that. So, I mean, we could still say, yeah, depending on feedback, we may add it later as an API that's also doable. I think to me, practically speaking, in app context, which is not super cheap either because you have to document it. So, I mean, once we have it, I'd be really likely to add an API. Probably not <laughs> because we would say, like, just set the switch and then worst case, the switch takes around for longer, right? Um, yeah, but so I think if you make a decision today to go with a switch, I just don't think we would add the API. To me, it's app context, which is some notion of temporary and API is forever. And Yeah. So yeah. really it comes back to how, like, is this corner case or is this mainline functionality that somebody to would want the, to toggle it? To me, the API isn't really the thing that concerns me. It was more like the, oh, no, we ask everybody that calls bind to pass this thing and it's true, right? That that was the thing that could, that would concern me. But like, if there's just a boolean that you, that you could decide to set to false if you really wanted to, but most people wouldn't, I think the cost of the API is fairly low. And I just wanted to reiterate uh, to make sure the breaking change we're looking at is when we have an XML uh, configuration and today uh, if we wanted to, like we would get a null a value for if we wanted to have bind to an array, but when we set it to true, then uh, we can get uh, pro properly the data in, uh, bind it in. But for JSON, there is no breaking change. Or you also have a breaking change for JSON. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, as I said, right, it's not quite hard to ex define the breaking change in here. But again, yeah, it is a breaking change. Like let's say in the same example, right? If uh, the JSON contains only one element uh, without the array object, it can still bind to the array in this case. So it is a breaking change in that sense. Logically, it makes sense uh, because arrays, uh, one object to arrays is can they can bind. So it's actually not an issue, but yeah, just pointing. I already pointed this out pretty much the same. Okay. Yeah, I think the behavior is basically what it says, right? It basically says whenever you bind something that is a single to an array, setting this property to true will now make it succeed. And that's agnostic to what the provider was. It would work for XML, it would work yeah. for JSON, it would work for anything else. There'd be probably also environment variables. I don't know what they, <laughs> oh, they work with uh, arrays, but like, it, that's basically the behavior you were you would be getting. So if we're fine with JSON having that behavior, then maybe the app context, which I'm, I'm fine with that too. Yeah, I mean, we are asserting this for the most part that we are fine with that, right? I think it's kind of the, we ship it and then we see what happens, right? Yeah. But I, yeah. Mr. Earhart, do you have an opinion? I mean, at first I wouldn't vote for the app context switch. And then Miriam kind of convinced me when she was kind of said, well, if we put in the app context switch and we get enough feedback that we need the API, we can add the API later. So now I'm more c closer to the fence. <laughs> I, I The reason I don't like app context switch is from the beginning. It's kind of what Emo said, it's not discoverable, but also it just, it feels too much like a hack, right? Like if you want to have differing behavior and you already have an options class, why wouldn't you just put it in the options class to, to be able to define which option you want to, which behavior you want. So that's why I always kind of lean away from app context switches. So I'm closer to, um, I think, I think at the end now I'm kind of like, yeah, it, it would probably be fine to put this behind an app context switch. It, in the off chance that it does break somebody. All right. The reason why I'm okay with an app context, which is I'm almost okay at not having the option at all, like for all the reasons listed. Yeah. Like. Yeah, I think that's generally the way we should see this. You, you should basically say, if we are okay with an app context switch, we basically have to say, oh, that's only needed by like less than a percent of people, right? If, if it's needed by more people, then we screwed up, right? <laughs> It is really just the to cover our asses in the in the long tail kind of situation. Exactly. Uh, also, I have a quick question for you guys. How do we even discover app context switches? <laughs> there's a they are part of the release notes, so they actually documented. I think there's a centralized list somewhere, I believe. Um, 
and then uh, yeah that's why i said it's a bit harder to reason about them in the context of a library right because as far as the system is concerned it's just a process by dictionary that you can only set once right so so realistically you know any library could ask for a random string in there right so that's why it works also for this library which is a new get package which happens to work everywhere but then also we ship this new get package in a particular version with the .NET stack so normally the way we document these is basically saying, oh, we you know the new version of the .NET stack is out, let's say .NET 6 or .NET 7, and then we document here the new compat switches that we added because we believe it might impact somebody, right? And that's how you would normally find them. For libraries, it's a bit more on the, well, you know, each library has their own notion of release notes or shipping schedule, right? And that, that might be different for those. But yeah, it's basically documentation. That's a quick yeah, answer. Uh, it's basically in internet search. <laughs> it's the only way yeah. you can find yeah, basically uh, it's Stack Overflow, right? <laughs> yes, uh, it looks like only Stack Overflow because I was trying to search for a list of switches someplace, but it's very hard for me to get anything. Uh, but also, like, I was have a quick, I have a quick uh, um, feedback as well, right? Uh, we have an options right there. Why don't we just use options and if we really need it, like, if, uh, because we already have the deprecated attribute that says, say, we'll be deprecating this next release, whatever. Yeah, so the so the general reason for that is so the way app compets app context switches work for us is they are meant to be temporarily, right? So they're they're basically meant to say, okay, we we introduce a new behavior, we're generally okay with the, with the with the new behavior. We assume most people are not impacted negatively by this new behavior, but we give people the escape hatch so that if they want to upgrade to the new version, they can just get the old behavior back easily. But then in the long run, the new behavior is going to be the land of the, the law of the land. So the app compat switch will eventually disappear. APIs can't disappear. So if we if we add an API, we have to support this behavior and basically both most of this behavior forever, right? That's kind of the trade-off. Uh, which you can argue in this case is just a simple if statement. So maybe the supporting both is not a big deal, which I'm okay with, but generally speaking, the idea of an app context switch is we can eventually you know delete the old behavior entirely from the product. Next. The place where an API would help here is really like you're consuming two libraries that have their own config sections. And those two libraries are using bind to get their to get their configuration. And one of them one of them wants this behavior and one of them doesn't. Right, like turning the app context switch to either one is going to break one or the other. Right, that's like the real risk we run by having a process wide switch here. But I mean, the real fix in that case is you fix your config. Like the the process the the switch, because the switch is really we had a behavior in the hold on five zero version of the package. You now upgrade to the 6.0 version of the package for some reason, um, and, and then uh, now things are behaving differently. So the app that's hosting it says this one thing that changed that's invisible, turn it off. Now they're working again. Now they really what they really have is a bug. Go fix your config, and then now they can turn the switch back off. And then when they get the version eight of the package, assuming or versions in of the package, assuming that we remove the uh, the thing, they'll keep working. That that so yeah, the app context is really a, if it's a behavior that we would have been okay just changing, but we're afraid there's like a one percent chance that somebody can't react to it correctly, then it's it's just an escape hatch, very temporarily. That's the idea. Oobs are weird, so maybe we would do a weird thing in an oob, but. The change here is I had a class previously. I had a class with an array inside of it. When I would bind that to a JSON object, a JSON file that didn't say that option is an array, it just had it like an, a, an object. Previously in my class, after I do bind, that array would be null. And now the array is no longer null. It's set to an a new array with one right. element in it. So the fix is delete the line of config. That goes back to the state you were in, where you had a line of config that didn't matter, so delete it. It didn't matter to this object, but maybe it matters to somebody else. 
reading the exact same data? Maybe. <laughs> anyway, like, I mean, it's almost getting to the point where it's like, do we add a switch at all? And do we just make this behavior? Like kind of what Stefan was saying. If we really think this is the right behavior. Like personally, I'm fine with that, which is why I'm moving or why I think app context is an okay compromise. But I can jam a little harder on no API is needed. Just make the breaking change. Yes. What is stopping people from using the older version of this package? Transitive dependencies. Right. They don't get to pick. It ships with ASP.NET as well. Um, oh, like no. In the shared framework. Yeah, but that's that they intentionally upgraded. The only people that we really, yeah. really care about is people using this from an application that they got upgraded to the next major without upgrading their platform. That's the real risk. So transitive dependencies. Well, and you can't, if you want to upgrade to .NET 6, you can't use the old version of this package if you're an ASP.NET app. Right, but I assume ASP given ASP.NET's history that you've, you're you already facing 700 major breaking changes that'll take like eight months to solve, uh, fixing a line of configs wow. is uh, <laughs> Shots fired. not a problem. Version 2 we to 3 was harsh, man. Improved. I, I understand there's some history there. <laughs> That was a really harsh upgrade. .NET 6 will be much easier, people. OK, I, I, I say let's do the app context switch and move on. And we'll get, if this is really breaking people and they needed the API, we'll get feedback. And yeah. we'll do that in 7. Plus, this is oob. I think, technically, we could add the API in a dot version. Just we don't. But I think we could because it's not baked into a targeting pack. It is an ASP.NET. If you get the higher version, that'll that'll win out. So you'll it'll pull in the package version instead of the platform version. At least that's how the system's supposed to work. Because ASP.NET, you ASP.NET five, you could reference the six zero version of the package, and you should see the new API. It does. The, the problem then is then it's not cross gen but it's not like this is a big assembly, so. Yeah. All right. Switch off. I think you meant. Uh... Feel the behavior isn't something people really want to switch on or off. This is just compatibility across an upgrade boundary. Either just make the breaking change or use an app context switch to provide temporary access to previous behavior. API can be added if we're proven wrong. I think that's our summary. I think so as well. So app context or rip off the band-aid, your guy's choice. Um, did you close the issue? Uh, I think you did. Yes, because it was a no new API. That's what we do with if the API is not allowed to change. Don't we need to fix it? We just don't. OK, sure. Um, okay, I guess it depends how you see the issue. I guess if you just say there's still an issue tracking that behavior needs to change, then maybe closing is not the best way of doing it. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thanks. But yes, that's the. We can just reopen it and change the tag, right? Like, yeah, please wait till afternoon. <laughs> okay.
<laughs> Unless you're planning on fixing it before the snap, in which case just make a new issue for your behavior. Um, but Emo's okay. tool will track the, it went from API ready for review to closed as we said no. I see. Okay, gotcha. Okay. All right. Quaternion.0 is missing. 57253. Uh, so basically on vector 4, 2, 3, and several of the other types, we have a 0 property explicitly for getting uh, the 0 concept uh, because it can be more efficiently intrinsified, etc. The proposal here is to also expose it on Quaternion since it is functionally similar to a vector 4. Um, and it can likewise be optimized. And it's a. Uh, it has the mathematical zeroness that someone's expecting with zero. Yes. Yeah. So the the API proposal here lists uh, lists quaternion as a class that's actually a struct. So calling new will return basically default of t. Yeah. So should this be a field because everything else is a field on this type? No, this is a, this is similar to the vector four property on the other types, and we cannot intrinsify fields. I see. And is for the generic math was zeroness defined as a property? We have additive identity. We do not have a direct zero concept. Okay. Yeah, the, the main thing here was for like helping to check that it was uninitialized, right? Because by default, you all the values are zero. So like the is identity is probably more useful from the math context, but from the concept of like, hey, has anything been done to this quaternion? Do I have something other than a default value from you know, declaring it as a property somewhere, you know, there, there wasn't the same sort of properties you have with the vector classes to check that state of like, this was just a nude up value that I know that it's equal to zero or something is to have those kind of same programming patterns. All right, and static properties don't need a read only. I don't right. think that makes sense. May not they can't mutate instant state. Yeah. All right. Objections? Nope. If only APIs of .NET doesn't render static. <laughs> For properties, apparently. Because they all show up as instance properties that really confused me. If only you knew the guy who wrote it. Yeah. I'll definitely have a chat with this fella later. X509 certificate 2. raw data memory 57448. Mr. Jones. Welcome. Hello. Am I allowed to talk? Sure. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, currently on X509 certificate 2, we have a property called uh, raw data. It returns a byte array. Um, because arrays are mutable, it returns a clone every single time. Um, and you know these you know byte arrays are going to be several hundred bytes to a kilobyte in size. So the idea is to expose a new property um, that returns some sort of immutable representation of the raw data that uh, wouldn't require us cloning it every time we give it out. So when we've done this internally um, for properties that we haven't exposed, um, like on system hex encoding and so on, we've actually exposed it as a span instead of a memory. And the reason for that is uh, we just assumed that a span is easier to use because it is kind of a first class citizen and memory is a weird construct kind of built on top of that. And um, if you want a copy of it, you just call two array and look, now you have your own standalone copy array and you don't have to worry about lifetime management stuff. Um, yeah. 
And the yeah. proposal actually started off as a span, um, but there's some discussion further down that you know read-only memory does have some good properties to it, like you can use it in async contexts, and um, it's you know a little bit more future-proof if we need to be able to say accept you know incoming data as a uh, uh, memory as well. Um, I think both would work, and to be perfectly honest, I don't have a p opinion either way. Um, I'll defer to the experts on uh, which representation is best. Yeah, the in the discussion, it was you know the the two things that stand out as if we return it as memory, it's still non-copying, uh, but if we return it as span, require a copy are stream.writeasync and uh, if you wanted to take the certificate raw data and run it through ASN Reader to read it to you know walk the payload manually ASN Reader takes a memory because it holds uh, a reference to the to the data and so it's was looking at this from the perspective of you know we have the uh, parameters should be the weakest type they can but return type should be the strongest type they can. And we can return a memory from a memory you can get a span. Uh, but if we return a span, there, then there's nothing you can do short of my evil pointer memory manager to get a memory back. So if we're returning a memory, the memory absolutely categorically has to be backed by a byte array, correct? We can't ever back it with anything else because now you have ownership problems again, correct? Or lifetime problems? Correct. And then Steve... Uh, I don't think he's come back yet. Yeah, uh, Steve pointed out that well, once we do that, now somebody could call uh, memory marshal try get array and unpack the array, and now they have a mutable reference to it, mm -hmm. which is fine. Like if you're if you're dropping down to unsafe code, like God help you, I'm not interested in in yeah. preventing you from shooting yourself. Um, yeah, and we could if we wanted to add a put a memory manager between the array and that that simply returns false from try get array. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm not interested in doing clever stuff like that. Right, and um, that's a that's a 1% yeah. accidental. I I accidentally had an array for compat reasons and then was like, ooh, I have an array here. Um, yeah, if I, I guess what I'm, what I'm kind of having heartache with is memory is at its core supposed to be an abstraction. It's supposed to be something where you don't necessarily know what's backing it. But in order for this API to work, we absolutely have to back it with a byte array, which means that people are going to take a dependency on that behavior. And at that point, why not just have an API that exposes a non-copy byte array? Yeah, and what, then just, and, and then just tell people like be responsible with it. What's our layering for uh, system collections immutable? What do you mean? Is immutable part of shared framework? Um, I believe so. Yes, yes, it's referenced by the four when you're building a console app, so it must be. I mean, like, would this be better if we just returned it as immutable raw data? Well, I mean, just because it's in the shared framework doesn't mean you can use it from Corlib, right? Because it's not in Corlib. I'm not in Corlib. Still... Where are you? Uh, Currently, System Security Cryptography X509 certificates, but in the next release, it'll be just System Security Cryptography. But still not I mean, in Corlib. Yeah, if you're outside of Corlib, you can probably add a dependency on it, would be my guess. If but it, yeah, the if challenge expose... is immutable is not as low as you want it to be, so that you need to double check that. Because you might actually depend on other modules that transitively depend on yours. <laughs> so there's a. We, we may have. It does seem weird if immutable indirectly depends on crypto, but yeah, you'd be amazed. But, but what, what's what's wrong with the idea of just having an API that returns a non-copying byte array, and then we just tell people like use this responsibly, because we're returning the concrete type that you would have taken a dependency on us returning anyway, right? I don't know. I mean, we're that's back in the when writing up FDG three. I did the analysis of do 
array returning properties make defensive copies or not? And the answer was basically 50 50. And well, this wouldn't this wouldn't be a property. This would be a uh, this would be a, a method like clearly named like get non copy and byte array or something like that. But I, I guess that again, the thing I'm having heartache with is why are we why are we talking about returning an abstraction when we're all in agreement that the actual backing store has to be a concrete type and that people will take a dependency on that? Because spans useless as a return value. That's the whole reason. Uh, once you've gone down to span, you can't you can't go back up to async. You can't go back up to stateful things like ASN reader. So, returning returning spans is the worst thing you can do to the caller, unless you know. I, I spans. think. Uh... Christoph Spolina would vehemently disagree with you there. Um, no, no, no. What uh, we really like are things yeah. that write to spans. Yeah, you have yeah. you have some memory, and you want the API to write into the memory. Things accepting a destination span as a as a parameter are great. Things returning spans are you you let things work for some percentage of the people, and you make things very complicated for the rest. So is your argument then that because there are already other system security cryptography APIs that work on memory, that this would naturally fit with those APIs? So you're t you're talking about this this as an ecosystem unto itself rather than just a standalone API? Sort of. I mean, it's also patterns and practices. We haven't done this a lot, so figuring out what it is that we want to do. But you know, if you look at ASN Reader, which is technically not system security cryptography. Um, but it's well, in, in the same very related. Uh, yeah. So it's you have the all these things that return ASN data. So after this, we could then go look at the ASN encoded data type, which also has a raw data property. Um, so you have these ASN encoded structures. Right now, we return the copy arrays, and then and you can read them. And then if we're looking for a uh, lower allocation overhead version, then well. Great, you called that. Now you got the span. Now you can't call the ASN reader. Uh, it, we we pushed you down to too low of a level too fast. If we yeah, had read only array, then sure, the closest we have is read only memory. Yeah. Now, if 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 you're making an argument that it naturally fits in the flow of like I have this. I, I called this property, got the read-only memory, and now I want to pass it to an API that takes a read-only memory, like without doing any type of intermediate translation. Um, if if that's the argument that that's being made, then I think that's a valid argument, and I'll I'll you know rescind my my uh, comments. Okay, I mean I can also be convinced, probably for span, just it feels wrong to me. Um, who haven't I heard from? Uh, oh, Mr. Tobe, you joined. Yeah, sorry. Other meeting ended. I'm back. No worries. <laughs> uh, so we were discussing the, the the virtue of memory over span for uh, raw data memory. You participated in the chat, but you know now here you can state which way you would you really feel in your heart of hearts. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think it would really depend over on what people do with the results of this. Um, there, you know, in cases we return span, it's because the vast majority of consumption is just, you know, doing something local on the stack, doing a compare, doing a search, something like that. What do people do with the raw data that comes back from an X509 cert? Um, if it's passed to other methods that might be async, then span doesn't make sense. I mean, we're, we're basically, but then again, I, I largely agree with Levi, Levi, I think, like the only reason we're talking about adding this is to avoid a copy. We're not slicing, we're not doing any sort of subset. It's purely hand something out that avoids a copy. But with read-only memory, you can get at the underlying thing anyway. So why not just expose the underlying thing? Even if you want to put an unsafe or dangerous or whatever prefix on it, just expose the the raw array and just like you can get from a memory. It's fair, so dangerous 
get raw data? I mean, I've, I don't necessarily know if we need to prefix it with dangerous. Um, I, like, what, what, what is the consequence if someone changes a spider eye? That somebody else who calls it now doesn't get the same thing? So the the two things that I can think of that are the most common of what to do with the return answer from data are save it to a file, uh, because it is, no matter what format you loaded the certificate from, this is the X509 certificate. It is the certificate. It's not the private key. It's not a. It's not the signed data structure that could have contained multiple of them. It's not the Windows serialized cert or serialized store. It's just the X509 data. Uh, so the, uh, it would be save it to a file or pass it into the X509 certificate to constructor to make a copy of just the public data. Uh, those so are the how, how two most common things. We, how bad would it be if we just took a breaking change and made raw data just return the underlying array? I mean, I don't, it's the same who thought it was a scratch buffer that they could modify. Right. Well, yeah. we, we take a breaking change and we basically say, if you're doing that, make your own copy. It's up to you. I, I don't know if I would be willing to go that far. Like I, we, we've seen problems with like system IO path and whatever returning shared arrays in the past uh, and people manipulating them and then things just going south. Um, because parts of the system were depending on them having uh, constant values. Um, but this is, but this is a, an instance of a cert, like as as opposed to a static. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't I can't think of too many times where people would get this and modify it and expect to do meaningful things, uh, except amusingly for our tests, which not are just testing this behavior, but it's they know that there's a like, hey, go load a a valid certificate now go modify it and run it back through the constructor and see do we get you know errors um, they're not trying to corrupt the data on an existing instance they're just they just know that it's their array and now they can start corrupting it for their own purposes and yes we could just change our tests but uh. yeah i don't see um i don't see any any documentation uh saying that it returns a unique copy every time so it is just an implementation detail that people probably well may may have taken a dependency on right well i mean that's the problem with returning arrays ever and why yeah i made fdg have the note of if you think you want to return an array from a property um don't so. i mean we've we've taken breaking changes like this in the past arguably in places that are even more pronounced like i think is it stream writer or a text writer dot new line? It's like a, it's a protected array. And we, it had been making it a defensive copy and we changed it maybe in .NET Core 2.0 or something to not. And I don't think anyone noticed. Huh. Interesting. So what do, do you, do you remember, uh, which, which property it was specifically? Oh, I see. Yeah, uh, textwriter.core new line is that yeah, that's what it, it was. Okay. Sorry, I'm just checking a few things. Um, I I could be convinced to take the breaking change. For the second time today, it makes my spidey sense tingle, but I can't can't come up with a very strong reason other than you know historical precedents and what if somebody's doing it wrong? Yeah, I mean we have. I, I guess the guideline, as you had mentioned earlier, is generally don't return byte arrays as properties anyway because you can't really reason about it's not return any way as a property well sure yeah, yeah yeah because you can't necessarily reason about whether the property is making a copy or not but if we if we clearly document going forward like this this could return you know a a cached copy um then people can actually start just writing optimized code or code that's at least optimized on future runtimes Yeah. 
I, I think the only thing that stands out for me on taking this breaking change is in issue 38.864, we actually made the opposite decision, which was to add as much copying as we could because we ran into an issue where somebody was mutating the underlying arrays and it was unexpected behavior. So we started adding a bunch of copies to exporting and uh, issuer name and subject name uh, to defend against this. So if we're okay with that breaking change, then maybe we can undo some of this. But you know that seems to go in, in contrast to the this particular change. Yeah, were they calling export or raw data? Do you remember? They were calling export, but I mean, it was the same underlying concept. You could do the same thing with subject name or issuer name. And, you know, because we were handing out the underlying arrays, you know, yeah. uh, you know. Yeah, well, because I feel like with export, that one, in my head, it does feel like you're calling a method that's returning an array, so obviously it's a unique array. Um, so I think even if we if we made raw data, say it's just returning the same array over and over and over again, um, which would certainly make for loops nicer. Uh, that that's that we should still make export return a copy. Yeah, I, I agree, but we did this. But for the other things, as part of that same change, we made copies for you know issuer and uh, and such, so that we uh, handed out some other copies in some places. Um, yeah, and and by the way, Steve, when when you came online, you had mentioned um like what do people do with this? Do they tend to pass it to APIs that take a read-only memory of byte uh, as a parameter? And the answer was like presumably yes. Um, so at least as far as the crypto and crypto adjacent stack, um, returning a read-only memory isn't the worst thing in the world. Um, it, it still makes me a bit uneasy that we're returning an abstraction for something that absolutely has to be backed by some like a concrete type that people will take a dependency on. But that's actually not the worst thing in the world, I guess. Like maybe we would just even document like this is a read-only memory, it is backed by an array. Like, if you need the raw array, this is how you get it. Keep in mind, this is unsafe code. Yeah. Emo's depth map that he just put in the Teams chat says we could take a dependency on immutable collections here if we wanted to. Can you cheaply get a span or a memory from an immutable collection? My use case is I want a span. Um, I'm going <laughs> to uh, feed it into a pem writer. Um, that's what brought this whole thing on me is as I was doing the uh, uh, PEM exports um, and I noticed that raw data was just copying and copying um, and PEM writer takes a span um, which is why it started off as a span and then I was okay with memory because well I can cheaply get a span from a memory um, yes. I'm not sure about that from immutable collections immutable yes, okay. array of T can go to span on memory yep we have as memory and we have as span now mind you it's read only but yes you can get to it. Well, we, I mean, we would be returning a read only anyway. So behavior wise, right. it's not, uh, it's not a terrible thing. Yeah. All I'm saying is that in order for you to construct an immutable array, you, you will always copy. There's no way for you to construct an immutable array without going through a copy at some point. Cause that's the only way we can enforce it to be. Right. But we could right now we have the, the field, you know, we have this, um, lazy raw data and instead of making it be a byte array we could make it be an immutable array and then just return that from a new property and then but the existing why? one would call just two array off of that like what does returning a mutable array get you that the other data types don't you didn't like that we were returning an abstraction i mean is a mutable array not an app well <laughs> I guess immutable array is not technically an abstraction. It's just a, a limitation over what you can do with a regular array. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Hmm. But in that sense, it's not different from read-only memory of byte. Indeed. So that's just if, if 
we are allergic to returning the memory. Um, like I like I mean, memory because it's I'm not allergic to it. I'm more versatile. Maybe mildly allergic. Interesting. It, it gives me a rash. It gives me a rash rather than a sneeze. Yeah. How about that? Uh, it actually looks like um, a mutable array dot as memory gives you access to the array, so you can uh, make an immutable array be not immutable. Yeah. I mean, you can do anything with unsafe code. It's great. Yeah. Once you go unsafe, you don't care. Yeah. Um, I, I, I guess I'm coming on the side of like just take the API as it's proposed. Yeah, I mean, alternatively, you know, if if we think that the property returning thing is span and that's fine, and if you're calling write async or you're trying to use ASN reader, then you have to deal with the copy. We could say that it just seems suboptimal. I mean, you could always just you know pass in a buffer and then tell x509 sir please write stuff into this buffer we could that saves you gc the, and now you the caller own absolutely everything yeah that saves gc it doesn't avoid the copy but yeah yeah well that's what most people want i mean have have you looked at the code that's that's going into the core libraries and asp.net like we are copying all over the place but we're avoiding gc's while doing it mm-hmm So, yeah, I'm certainly okay with this because I'm the one who marked it ready for review. Um, yeah, I've, I've give, given given the scenarios that we want to be able to take this and pass it into other places that accept read-only memory. Like I can, I, I can see this API working as part of that larger crypto adjacent ecosystem. All right, and scrolling back through chat, because, sorry, chat, I wasn't paying attention to you. Um, looks like chat is for immutable array or read-only memory instead of read-only span. So. Yeah. I, I think this is, given the ecosystem that this lives in, I think it's special enough to return memory instead of span. Generally... Generally, for the typical case, I think I agree with Selena um, in that if you return a span, then you give the caller the option of what they want to do with that. If they want a standalone copy, then they would just call to array and look, you have a standalone copy. Um, but this is not that. What are you sorting by, Emo? It's uh, complicated. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, all right, so since we're doing this for X509 Certificate 2 raw data, should we do it for ASN encoded data raw data at the same time? Uh, is there, sorry, was there already an API review for that or? No, I'm, this is the, should we just throw the second thing in here as it's the same thing on a different class? That's in PKCS, uh, right? No, it's in encoding. Okay. Off of ASN encoded data, uh, we then have the, the X509 extensions and the PKCS attributes. But The raw data property returns the same array instance every single time, unless I'm looking at the wrong type. Are you looking at ASN encoded data dot raw data as a property? I mean, I'm, I'm looking just at the API catalog to see where it was, but... Uh, if okay. we're returning that one direct, then hooray. Yeah, the, the ASN encoded data dot raw data property just returns the same instance every, ting every single time you call the getter. Um, amusingly enough, when you call the setter, it makes a clone. Because, of course, it does. Thanks, Brian. The, construct the constructor makes the, crop makes the uh, copy because the yeah. constructor just calls reset. Okay, so we don't need it there. Right. There's a nice comment there that says .NET Framework demands that we return the array without copying. Yes. 
Huzzah. Compatio. Because I guess they actually had scenarios where people may have manipulated that array. Probably means we um, did so internally. Yeah. Mutability was a mistake. Um, M sharp. <laughs> hey, look, that's the last issue marked as seven zero. Thank you, Kevin. I should actually prove it or something. Are, are we looking at that next one with dread or, <laughs> yeah. or what? Emo, have you had enough alcohol to talk about the object serializer? Um, uh, in principle, yes, but we need somebody else in that room. We need Andy in here, so I haven't scheduled it. So we should have a dedicated conversation, but we should skip this one for now. Okay. Um, since Tanner's here, we could do the pause intrinsics one. Oh, Eric, he's here too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, if it's zero opinions on the remaining order. <laughs> uh, Add it, consider adding socket send to receive async overloads that allied the socket flags argument. 43934. So just simplified overloads that do the right thing. I think the concern is 99.999% of calls pass socket flags dot none. So why require it to be specified? Um, if we did want to address that, I don't know whether adding new overloads or just adding a default argument, default value for socket flags is the right thing. Although my guess is in some of them, we couldn't add a default because it's not at the end. Uh, it, looking at this, um, it looks like cancellation token is the only thing that might, oh, endpoint, ah, never mind. Yeah. Well, I mean, for- So it looks for, like this is the only one that would need it. Would you be okay with um, with just that one having an overload and the others having defaults, or does that asymmetry kind of not sit well with people? I mean, we already have asymmetry in these APIs because they've been added to and added to and added to over the last 20 years. So um, okay, I, I don't have a particularly strong why? vomit reaction. So um, I'll start with why are these proposed as extension methods instead of overloads? Because that's what they are today, for some reason. I mean, not for some reason. Not what the I reason think, is. I think this they was when this opened. I, I think we. My guess is this was opened before we moved. Uh, uh, so, historically, we had added the socket task extensions thing because um, uh, we thought these APIs were going to go down level to .NET Framework in some fashion, and then we kept adding to socket task extensions, even though we knew that wasn't going to happen, and then. I think in either five or maybe it was six, we basically added everything from socket task extensions back to socket. And now socket task extensions is just dead legacy. So cool. I, I don't think we're adding to it. I, 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 see, I, I, I forgot that we moved before this that happened. Six. Yeah, I, it looks we like, did, right? Yeah, yeah, looking at API catalog, we clearly did it in six. Um, so that's, that's good. So then, yeah, let's basically not do this on task extensions, but I think the proposal makes sense. I personally would probably go with overloads, mostly because it kind of scares me because many of them already have a ton of overloads and maybe now make things in the middle potentially defaulted. Like I just, I mean, cancellation tokens always at the end and we very carefully crafted them like this way, but I just wouldn't do this for the socket uh, flags. I think I would just keep them as overloads. 
also that allows us to actually default values that are not none if we ever wanted to well to change the defaults later well i mean you could not so much changing as in like imagine we had a new flag to socket flags and we wanted that to be on by default right yeah. like how would you do that so that'd be changing yeah. the default behavior interestingly it looks like uh some of the some of the cancellation tokens are defaulted in some art which is a bit weird at least looking at uh apis have done like yeah, that, that that's not consistent. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think they were added as overloads or originally. I think we probably just did whatever we did on task extensions. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. They're they're not defaulted when they are overloads. You're right. So yeah, we not. That's the other reason why I would just go with overloads and call it good. Okay. Sure. Yeah, once you have six overloads, I think overloads are safer than trying to make things default in the middle. <laughs> it's just easier mm. to reason about. What namespace is this? System net sockets? I believe so, yes. System dots system dot net dot sockets. And the tide that would go on the socket, not socket. Yeah. But yeah. Seems reasonable. Yeah, I didn't merge in these yet. All right, so yeah, everything from socket task extensions is gone, right? Right. Did we mark the type as editor browser one never? Don't know, but probably makes sense. Well, they should do that. No, it doesn't seem like we did. Um, I'm I mean, not it's sure about being obsolete. Oh, we, we marked like... all of its all of its methods as editor browser will never. Yeah, we should probably just mark the type as well. Because at this point, it's just noise in the namespace. I think marking the methods makes sense because I think in C sharp they show you both, and it's just they don't bind anymore, <laughs> which is weird. All right, so receive message from took it as ref, and now it wants to not take it. I guess that's default goes in and don't care what comes out. Yeah. Hope hopefully you weren't supposed to remember that for a future thing. If that makes sense in context, then okay. I have no idea if it does. It might be worth double checking with Jeff. these mean on behalf I mean any there there's my uh, warning on that one but, okay so
we went with overloads, we dropped the extension type, I think I did those edits correctly, and double check receive message from because that socket flags was ref. Anything else? Um, can you add the editor possible? Did you already, already do that? Oh, on the existing? Yeah, just add the type as a partial and put the attribute on it. That might compile. Nice. Nope. Add clear method to memory cache four five five nine or three, which involves adding a method to an interface. Nope. Have we decided we can't do this? We've said we can't do the interface, but we should be able to add it to the class. Yeah. I mean, at this point, the question is, what value does the interface add? None. Can we just? obsolete the interface. Is it maybe meant for unit testing? It's meant for ASP.NET loves interfaces. <laughs> yeah, so unit testing then, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even, yeah, could have been an abstract class, right? I mean, the problem is once we add core functionality to the class, but not the interface, the interface literally is no longer usable even for that, right? I mean, yes and no, but a lot of people, a, the, a, a real reason people use the interface a lot is like you you try to get the iMemory cache from your DI services, right? Yeah, and but the DI system doesn't require interfaces. All their samples no, show using interfaces, but that was that's not a technical requirement of the system. Well, my point is more like if we don't deprecate the interface, what, what ends up happening is we add methods to memory cache that nobody can invoke, right? Because everybody still takes the interface. Yeah. That's kind of defeating the point. So I would say if we if we decide that we, I mean, the other ones are just more like, I don't know. This is where we create iMemory cache too. Hmm. I mean, if you really wanted hmm. to, that would not be a terrible idea. But like, I, I think that to me seems worse than just agreeing yeah. that the, the way moving forward is the, you know, the base type and call it good. I was joking. Be <laughs> clear. <laughs> and we can't default implement it because I memory cache only implements I disposable. If it implemented something like I get or I enumerable, then given that it has uh, remove, you could have feasibly implemented clear as a dim, but no, it yeah. doesn't, so we can't. Also, they're net standard 2.0, so they can't be a dim. Oh, yeah. no. They're, ah. So I'm, I'm looking at memory cache right now, and they already have some APIs that aren't on iMemory cache. Um, so having an API added just there and not to the interface would be consistent with prior practice. But they also have a finalizer, so whatever. I guess, of course, they do. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, honestly, like, I mean, it depends on what clear is for, right? If clear is more for the host to call in super rare cases, then maybe it doesn't have to be in the interface because interface is more for people that just retrieve information from the cache. But, like, it still irks me that we have this growing discrepancy between the types, right? So, ideally, we should just get rid of my memory cache in the long run. I'm not getting rid of me, I just mean hide it, obsolete it, move on with life. I think that's just a larger thing that should be addressed somewhere else. Like there's 
there's literally every time we try to make something in extensions, some new thing, it's we have an interface and we can't change it. Like I think that should be its own. Let's get rid of all the interfaces proposal. Like let's not hold this API hostage for that larger discussion. Yeah, I, I agree. There's nothing stopping us from adding the API to the concrete type, though. Yeah, I, I wouldn't go that far. I would just say we should file the issue now. <laughs> yeah, because there, there is. Um, we, remember we discussed this uh, yesterday too in in a separate forum. Like what what it means to have you know a bunch of testable interfaces across many different types, not just this one. Um, that those conversations can all be folded together. We hit the same thing in DI with service collection, right? It had I service collection, and then we wanted to add a bunch of like, try methods to it, and we couldn't add it to I service collection. Yeah. Because if, if this really is meant for, you know, testability or DI scenarios, it would be nice to have something that we can position as, you know, first class across a lot of the framework, not just this, that can evolve as the concrete types also change. I mean, honestly, it's not just testing, right? It is it is decoupling, right? Like, the, our memory cache has an implementation to it, and some library might not want to depend on that implementation, right? They just want to say, I need a cache, get it, give me it from the DI container, and I'm going to add some stuff and get it later. Right. I, for stuff like that, I don't think we should necessarily provide the interfaces that are supposed to be used by the entire world, because like, we're clearly going to make an interface for the behaviors that we're implementing. And if you need something that our interface can't describe, like now our interface is holding you a third party hostage, um, which is not a tenable situation to be in. But, but the, yes. The, the point is, the library doesn't really care what the implementation of the memory cache is, right? It just no, but they, they care about the functionality that's exposed by it. And if our interface only has three APIs that it'll, if, if our interface only ever has three methods that it'll ever expose, right. like that kind of dictates what functionality any given implementation could ever have. Right. I mean, so the real way, according to our design guidelines for doing this, is instead of making an iMemory cache and a memory cache, it's you make memory cache be an abstract class. And then you make some way of having what the default implementation is, whether you call that default memory cache or just you know a static uh, method on memory cache of give me the default implementation. And then using something like DI, they can say bind a, you know the singleton of memory cache to memory cache dot default. And yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the weird thing about that, and I, I know, Steve, you were actually running into this uh, very recently, was when you have virtual methods now depending on virtual methods, uh, it affects what optimizations you're able to make. Indeed. I'm, like, it, I'm not saying it's a, that evolution is trivial in that case, but yeah. its evolution is possible in that case. Yes. It just means that if we were if we were to introduce a clear method, for instance, on an abstract base class, we would have to have, you know, a really good answer for should clear be written in terms of any other virtual method that might exist on the class that someone may have overridden, or should it be its own completely unique implementation? Mm -hmm. and or no ops. Does that mean and yeah. Yeah. So does that mean the default implementation no ops or froze? But, right, that's the, you know, the ASP, or the stuff that came from ASP.NET, so most of Microsoft extensions is a class and then an interface of the same name that copied the, the public surface area. But that's, this is why we don't do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the class right now. It looks like they have no virtual methods other than um, the dispose method. So, yeah. So sure, because they use the interface as the... Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Virtual. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just double checking to make sure what you wrote was correct, and I, I believe it is. Yeah, and yeah, Jeremy K. Uh, or Jeremy Korzynski points out that uh, there are other things that we did for six, which I don't know if are already showing up, um, that we added on the class, but said we couldn't modify the interface for this exact type. So. Okay, sounds good. 
Hey. Uh, can you can you link the issue I just filed? I just filed five seven five nine six to keep track of this interface stuff. So I see it here. What else oh do yeah, you want? yeah, because I because I linked it to you. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. All right. Oh, we're doing so this well. one's probably me. Uh, basically, we have op app context, and it allows you to get data, set switch, and try get switch. But if you want to set data, you have to go through app domain. And app domain people just really shouldn't touch, so we should make sure to expose the correct API on app context. It already exists, It's just, and it's public. It's just not in the ref assembly. Do we know a reason why we never put it in the ref assembly before? Uh, yes. Jan listed it somewhere down below, and it basically boils down to uh, there was plans to not expose it. Uh, there, there was plans not to expose app domain at all, and then we ended up exposing app domain, and it just never ended up happening. Yeah. So it's basically just oversight. Well, I mean, it it's really fully was supported, and it's just you. If you want to do it today, you have to, you have to get the data through app context, but set it through app domain, and that just doesn't make sense. Why the the APIs are functionally separate in .NET Core? Right. I mean, it seems cleaner to me to to do this, and then basically not use app domains for that. Yeah. Well, I mean, what's it... what's weird is, is if you're trying to use, um, you know the app domain set data concept, but you're, you also care about framework. So you're on net standard too. You still have to switch to app domain, but I do agree that it's weird that we put the get without the set. Yeah. So the only one, one thing that we might want to do, and this would be purely a doc issue is, um, unless you're calling set data at the very beginning of your application, um, the values that are in app context are likely to be, um, are likely to be either cached or starting to get baked in uh, as legit compiles more and more stuff. Um, so we should just make sure to tell people like, hey, set data is really, really meant to be a startup thing. Like if you call it in the middle of your application running, you might not get the behaviors you expect. Is it like, I don't even know what the app, because that's true for app context, get and set switch. Um, Basically, I don't know what the data that... is. Data is basically switch for anything that's not a Boolean. So you can set strings, you could set a GUID in there, you can basically set whatever you want. Um, yeah, this and, is just a global dictionary, right? Yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and so functionally, um, as soon as something gets the value the first time, if you and, and caches it in, for example, static read only, which is common behavior for switches. Uh, then modifying it in the future will not impact anything that's already cached the value. Mm -hmm. But that's yeah. relatively true of any property in existence. Um, I think I think I agree with Levi. It's good to call out on the docs, though. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, it's just a doc issue. Yeah, and actually thinking about it, I don't think get switch is cached. I think it's just most of our uses of app context. We use a local app context that then. Uh, is where the cache, that's the read Correct. it once and maintain consistent behavior. Correct. Yeah, and, that, and sometimes, that's what we meant. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes we also um, the the JIT could uh, could say, oh, I'm I'm now caching this thing, or I'm now I'm now starting to JIT the methods in this class where you had a before field in a constructor that went and read the value of this and set it into a static read only field. Well, now the code gen's actually being baked with that, so there's no way through reflection to ever change that anymore. Right. Like random stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Objections? Noted. <laughs> uh, 
Add diagnostic source right of T to assist with trimming. 50454. Air Earhart. Yep. So this one's a bit tricky, <clears throat> but I'll try to explain it as best as I can. So we have already diagnostic source dot right. And you can you just give it any object and it basically uses reflection over the object. And so in when we were doing trimming in 6.0, we marked this API as um, requires unreferenced code because it's it's basically a serializer, right? And kind of the, maybe not the issue, but the inconvenience we ran into is that since this API is object, we couldn't stick a um, dynamically access members on a type and to say like to preserve all the members on this type. And so if you look at like the bottom um, example, this record begin request diagnostics, um, like if you have a, uh, here we were using, we were using um, anonymous types as the, the payload into write. And you kind of, there's no way to like mark those the, the anonymous type as you should preserve this member, this member, this member because, you know, people we're going to need those properties when we get reflected. When di diagnostic listener dot right is is being <clears> called, or, <clears throat> and so the so the solution here, the proposed solution here is to add new overloads to write that takes a T that we can add dynamically access members to. So that way the properties are preserved by default. It's still, it doesn't make the API 100% trim friendly because if there's pro, you know, properties off of those properties, we still can't, the trimmer still will trim out those things. But at least in the case where you're using anonymous types or even you don't have an anonymous type, but you don't wanna go mark you don't want to manually have to mark all the properties as as trimmer please keep these this way at least the top level properties get automatically marked for trimming or kept for trimming well you also couldn't right for anonymous types there's no syntax would even allow you to do that right right yeah we i'm pretty sure i might have yeah i, I guess in the conversation it, when I came up when I came up with this proposal, it was because I was changing a bunch of our code to make it trim safe, and I basically had to make it not use anonymous types to make it. Work. Right. I mean, I think that's reasonable. I don't know what else we would do. Abin Jabandin et was subjectionen? I didn't get that. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Has anyone any objection? I mean, I guess the owners of Diagnostic Source aren't here, but it's been out since March and nobody's subjected yeah. to it like yeah i mean this it looks fine to me the generic will get preferred for anything other than args being uh explicitly typed as object um and then it just gives your linker something to paint yeah you still get so, the warning as a call oh, go ahead Stefan. i'm just gonna ask like assuming that there was like a dynamically access member types public properties recursive or something um and that like would that be useful to serializers and would you be able to get rid of the requires unreferenced code attribute and would that even be possible like uh, long term i can point you to the the issue that talks about exactly that okay. right there it is. yeah Thanks. but it's if this was done then these this would now all of a sudden become uh quote unquote friendly in that it's terrible because it's everything is in scope but it's it at least knows to paint that then got it right so the attribute itself will be meaningless for the other parameter that is typed as object because it would only keep things that are on object not the actual type that's being passed in well there are no objects no i meant the existing overloads 
right, the existing overloads are just pure all, all out unsafe. Like nothing's going to be preserved on by itself because of this call. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. So if you would put dynamically accessed members, I guess that doesn't get, doesn't apply to parameters. It only applies to types, right? Right. Yeah. It, Never right. Mind. Yeah. It has to be a type that's attributed yeah. with it. So, that, so basically, that means if you want to attribute a parameter, you always have to introduce a generic then. I mean, it, assuming that the, your parameter is typed to object, then yes. Like a, any API that does reflection over some, so any object like get type and then start re reading the properties off of it, that's just the trimmer cannot recognize that pattern at all. It sees there's any kind of object going into here. I have no idea what properties are going to be on that object. Right. But if this, if the hmm. 99 percentile of these implementations just called value dot two string, then you wouldn't put this here because it's statically verifiable. Yeah, uh, none of the implementations of diagnostic source just called two string. Right, they, but they, I'm... they loop over the properties. They it literally calls. Right, get, but it, uh, just, get type, it's get the type. reflection that it's doing that's the problem, not the fact that it's typed as object. Right, yes. You can have APIs that take an object that, yeah, only call <laughs> get type or two string or and, equals. And this still that. actually won't quite solve everything because if you have a a local, or if you have a, a, an expression that is typed as a as a middle type in a hierarchy, but you have a, a fully derived instance, it won't know that it's keeping it off the derived type, right? Because this will only preserve the static closure. I mean, well... So it helps. No, uh, you can solve that though, right? Is you don't call value.getType. Instead, you say type of t dot blah. And then no matter what... You... No, I mean, in this, in this method, if somebody calls diagnostic source dot write and they have a the thing that they're passing in is in the is of a variable typed foo, but the value is a bar extends foo. Uh, it won't preserve the properties off of bar. That's right. Right, but that doesn't ma necessarily make it unsafe, because like what I said, if the implementation says type of t dot get properties. Yeah, yeah. Right, like then no matter what, whether the trimmer, whether you're trim or not, it it that you know it statically mm -hmm. only uses type of foo. Right. You can only see what basically your type was. Yeah. But this is just going to turn around and call, cast it to object and call this one, uh, which presumably means, or which doesn't have the type information. So for this specific scenario is, is what I'm saying. You're... And what I'm saying is I don't think that's 100% a slam dunk that it's just going to turn around and call right with object. It has to. Why? This is not abstract or virtual. This is. Oh. You can't do anything other than call the existing one. <laughs> so it kind of is a slam dunk. You kind of have to do that. <laughs> but I guess the behavior is still meaningful, right? You would only expose basically what the link had preserved, which, you know, if you did everything correctly, it should be the set that, so basically it shouldn't be observable, basically what I'm trying to say. It will be observable for the reasons Jeremy just said. Okay, because, then I didn't catch Because the... value.getType would return type of bar in that case. And so you'd get all the properties that are on bar. But unless but the you... The only going to remember. Uh, it's yeah. only going to preserve the ones that are on... Oh, if you didn't trim, basically. So if you if you call this via trimming, you would get a different, different behavior than if you wouldn't call it via trimming. Well, with trim. if, yeah. It would, if you called it with trimming, it would depend on whether or not it thought your program ever cared about some property hanging off of the bar for yeah. other reasons. Yeah, that sucks. Well, the, I mean, the huge the, like diagnostic source is just completely un, un trim unfriendly yeah. because the program doesn't declare which properties it actually cares about. It's the user that's running the app that's trying to like turn on diagnostics about it. They're saying, "Give me, you know, property one dot property two dot property three off this thing," and that's where we're getting the reflection from. And so it's it's not even your app that's doing the reflection, if that makes any sense. It's like an external thing from your app that's declaring which properties you care about. I see. And it, there's, you know, the hands are up. That's why we slapped it with Ricard's and reference code, because the, 
the trimmer will unless it unless it's literally preserve everything about this object the trimmer can't tell what properties it needs should we leave it as is then I, I, the value it does have is the the anonymous types like anonymous types sealed types um things or anywhere that you have your your expression type and your runtime type match it it does solve the problem for you it's just you know right, polymorphism so you is yeah so you make and it better but not recursive. perfect yeah polymorphism and recursive are still problems which is why it's still attributed requires on reference code yeah. so yeah i think it i think it's you know for just a little bit of il payload we can improve some experiences so it seems reasonable to me. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Given that it's already a best effort anyway, it's at least a better best effort. <laughs> right. It's more of a convenience to help you a little bit. Yeah. two minutes left with the next two issues seem both easy should take a look at them i'm i'm all for speed running api review let's do this chat did comment that you know spending 40 minutes on an issue didn't seem as quick and asked what our slow was so i told them 10 to 20 hours that may actually be a little balling um, it but yeah let's try for quick The last one should be super quick. All right. Prove it. So we have this struct called dependency. Um, it already overrides equals. The APL proposal is to add I equatable to it. And also market read only, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, and also market read only. That is the first half of the issue title. <laughs> I mean, they both make sense to me. Yeah, I thought we had an analyzer that uh, that said if you have a struct which overrides equals, it should also be I equatable, I guess. Probably, but we probably didn't have run that in V1. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, yeah, this, this seems straightforward. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, if I recall from my exploration and things, non-read-only to read-only is non-breaking. So. Correct. Right. It only has two properties. Both of them are get-only. Yeah, and are taken in the constructor. Yeah. I mean, it also applies to the three methods, but yeah. See. Forty seconds. So Tanner, this one is fast if you do the right thing. Yeah. So basically, it's a hardware intrinsic, um, and so I'm saying it's necessary. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when working with threading, um, we expose some primitives like spin weight and such today, but those don't provide as fine grained control over uh, directly emitting effectively a pause. Um, exposing these intrinsics would allow us would allow users to write their own um, more fine-grained spin loops that are effective for uh, their high-performance threading scenarios. Is are yield and pause actual opcodes here? Yes. Okay. And what's the reverse element bits and the uh, CPU that's ID? The, that's the person creating a partial. Um, and just listing the last thing in there. Okay. And are, are these um are these opcodes uh close enough in behavior that we would also do like a 
a common abstraction over the two. I asked or, about that, and yeah. uh, it, there was no consensus on whether we wanted that or not. Okay, and if we, I guess if we had such an abstraction in the future, we would actually probably put it on thread or something like that. Right, and there's potentially okay. enough differences between these platform-specific ones, both in terms of number of cycles they wait, among other things, that you might not want a common abstraction for them. The common abstraction is then just, like, spin weight. Works for me. Lazy. Do you do you see us using this immediately within uh, the DCL? We already have our own very uh, fine-tuned algorithms that use these intrinsics on the C++ side. Okay. It's possible we could move some of that to managed with this, but that would require more in-depth discussion and investigation on whether it's worthwhile. Fair enough. All right. Um, well, we both have cleared everything that we think that we could do today, and we have run out of time. And with that... I will see everyone in about three weeks. All right. I declare this meeting adjourned. Tschüss.